Dear Mr. President, we believe that these changes will compel, in the very near future, and whether we like it or not, public measures that move radically beyond any steps now proposed or contemplated. That was part of a recent plea by 37 American scientists, union leaders and social planners. In a memorandum addressed to President Johnson, a memorandum called the Triple Revolution, they forecast profound social changes because of technical advances. And most far-reaching of all, they look bleakly at the working man's life when automation really begins to bite. The President was asked to take note that within 10 years, work will be strictly rationed. Only a small proportion of the population will be allowed to work. The rest will be paid to be idle. Predictably, there was a howl of protest from the American press. But those same American papers are now carrying almost daily alarming headlines about the way automation is swallowing up jobs. Automation major cause and loss of 40,000 jobs, shouts one recent headline. Automation now seen as executive threat, wails another. But disregarding the emotion, and there's certainly plenty of that flying about on this particular subject of machines and men, the facts are plain enough already. For example, in Arkansas, more than 15,000 out of 21,000 Negro farmhands have lost their jobs to machines. Machines which have multiplied from 482 to more than 5,000 in less than six years. In one New York firm, employment of packing house union workers has slumped in 10 years from 22,000 down to 9,000 since the arrival of new machinery. But machines can free men as well as throwing them out of work. 30,000 New York electrical workers now have a 25-hour week. It sounds blissful, but in fact, it's only another aspect of the problem. And the planned and enforced shorter working week make the problem of how to spend time off very much ours as well as America's. The Triple Revolution stated that America is the stage on which the machines and man drama will first be played for the world to witness. The first act of this drama in Europe is being played out now in a small town a few miles from Manchester. Lee in Lancashire, main industries, textiles and coal mining. An unlikely place to find a glimpse of the future, but it was here that the shortest working week in Europe was negotiated by union official Jack Brown. And this question of leisure was one that was quite uppermost in our minds. Um, <clears throat> for example, it was put to us by certain people that um, if you give men a three-day working week instead of five-day working week, they would quickly become bored and would not know what to do with themselves. Um, I took the view that uh, this implied that working men could only be happy if they were working, making money for other people in a sense. We recognised, of course, that such a considerable increase in leisure time would cause personal problems, but it was one that was a matter for personal readjustment. I think any problems um, that do arise really come from the fact that society as a whole has not woken up to the fact that industry is on the move. This machinery was put in 20 months ago. It cost half a million pounds and brought automation to the textile industry. It also brought survival, for only through modernization can Lancashire have a textile future. The men work round the clock. For some men, a three-day week. More leisure than work. Well, I'm glad to say the scheme's been working well. Uh, from our point of view, and I think from the point of view of the operatives. From our point of view, we get more machine hours per week, which are vital. From theirs, they get a shorter working week, and I have noticed that there's much less absenteeism since we started this scheme than there was before. Will this increased leisure create problems in the future for all industrialists? The chairman of directors, Mr. Geoffrey Jolly. I think so. Um, I'd hate to think, though, that the individual's leisure is something which has to be organized for him. Surely the thing we all want to aim for is to encourage individuals to organize their own leisure to suit themselves best. Why then has Frank Roberts given up the job? Well, uh, I find that I have too much time on my hands. It's more or less humdrum to me. I mean, uh, I get up in the morning and I've had my breakfast 
I get the car out. I'm uh, tinkering about with it, best as I can. Polishing it. In fact, it must be the most polished car in Lee. Oh, yes, I have some leisure, but um, I don't think it's a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, A, there's not so much of it as all this, and B, I always find plenty to do. I like to have plenty in front of me. It looks all right, I suppose, to the experts on paper. Probably they've worked it out. But have they worked it out about our time, leisure? We've too much time on our hands. I do some gardening. I still play tennis, but not as much as I used to. And I like music. And one also thinks about one's work. It's a good time to think, really, in the garden. Gardens in Lee are used for many things. If they offer me a two-day week, it'd suit me fine. One three-day man who finds leisure no problem is Jim Atherton. Well, I enjoy every bit of, bit of my leisure. I've got two caravans that can spend my time on a one at real. I go down there a lot during my holidays, and uh, I've got this to paint up, and got a bit of decorating at home to do. When I say it's a rainy day or anything like that, I've got a minor bird, I've got some dogs. I've plenty of things I can pass my leisure time with. Yes, I've never stopped for doing things. I say, if I'm not doing no work at home, I can go in the pubs and the clubs and I do a bit of singing. And I can enjoy myself that way. Plays a mouth organ, I've got... Uh, what do you call them? Uh, Melodium. I've always something to do. I'm never... Don't get bored at all. But not all his workmates are as contented as Jim Atherton. Like many other towns which grew up with industry, Lee offers little to the man with time on his hands. Leisure has turned 22-year-old Tony Noon into a part-time housewife. His wife works an evening shift, leaving Tony much of the time to look after his seven-month-old daughter, Michelle. The Noons share a small terrace house with Tony's mother. They're trying hard to save out of his 15 pounds a week to buy a home of their own. I've learned a lot more than what I would have done before. I mean, ah! I wouldn't have liked uh, changing nappies before, but it don't bother me now. I'm washing her, feeding her, and putting her back. No, you know, knowing what I'll give her. Because otherwise, I, I wouldn't have had a clue. I mean, there's nothing doing Lee. There's, they had a museum, but uh, they knocked it down. So there's nothing really, if you've no money, nothing at all. If you walk around the streets, there's nothing. I suppose there's a few places of it, historical in your life, but you see, once you've seen them, you've seen them, haven't you? I'm interested uh, in art when it's on television, when they're telling you about the person and changes in his life. Well, I won't go to art gallery in Bali, no. <laughs> Why not? There are a lot of puffs. Yeah. Yeah. Looks stupid. Don't fancy it at all. I like having a couple of pints in the afternoon. Breaks the day up for you and you can have a good chat to somebody. We talk to the landlord and gives us his tips for the day. Back them sometimes, sometimes they win, sometimes they don't.
Well, I think I have too much time off. Of course, she's happy when I'm working all the time. It's more money. And she objects to me betting. If I run out of money, get called a lot of names. When you go to Blackpool, what you need to go with is a lot of money and you can really enjoy yourself. It is a grand holiday if you know where to go and what to look for and you've got a pocket full of money. But Blackpool you need twice as much as where you would need anywhere else. The pound note doesn't go nowhere but th this is why you go on your holidays to spend the money that you've saved over a period of time to enjoy yourself, to relax to let the wife buy what she wants, to let the children have 95% of their own way. I don't say all their own way, because I don't think anybody can run to giving the children everything they see and all they want, but they get a good percentage of it. And we have a damn good holiday. Cliff Porter has been working the three-day week for 20 months. He saved 90 pounds out of his 19 pounds a week wage to take his wife and two daughters on a one-week holiday to Blackpool. In the words of The Economist, leisure is now a growth industry. Time off in this country has increased significantly over the last decade. Five million people attend race meetings in Britain every year. Four million people have the do-it-yourself fever. There are 20 million dedicated gardeners. 18 million members of public libraries. Two and a half million theatre goers. Leisure has already given this generation far more freedom than their grandparents. But our ability to enjoy leisure is still hampered by deep-seated feelings of guilt. A heritage of 19th century Puritanism which insisted that doing nothing was a sin. Temptations like pubs and dance halls must be strictly controlled. So must almost every activity whenever man has time on his hands. Bikinis may now be reluctantly allowed on our beaches, but an all-night chemist is still a thing of wonder. Seven days and 90 pounds later. For Cliff Porter and his wife, a last shilling's worth of deck chair. For the children, farewell to Wonderland. back home to the same routine in the house that'll soon be empty with Barbara at work and the children at school. Well, once I get out of bed and I've got the children off to school, while the children's here, I don't feel too bad. But as soon as they go through the door, it seems to descend that you're in the house all day on your own. Uh, you wonder, what can you do? Uh, so I start off in the small back place and I find myself wandering into the kitchen, looking for something that may catch my eye, that wants doing. And then I wander perhaps down the hall into the front place and have a look round. If I see something that wants doing, I don't always do it, you know. Um, it, it's a feeling that you really can't describe. It's just a feeling of boredom and depression. You get really depressed. He, he gets me depressed sometimes during the winter when he, he doesn't seem to find anything to do. I don't know, he sits in the house all day and then when I come home, he's, he nags me to death. I don't know how to nag him why, but he nags me to death sometimes. And uh, he does get really fed up. This is true. Um, on odd occasions, when it is really bad, the children have gone to school, I've literally just gone back to bed again because, it, um, not really because I've been tired, but because I've been bored. And then I find that by the time I have waken up, it's been dinner time, so I've got half of the morning over by sleeping. Now, I can't afford to stay at home uh, with him and kind of hold his hand, but uh, he goes out at the night when I come home from work. He'll go out then for a walk or anything, but... Well, leisure, with, with having so much leisure, you, you tend to run out of money. Um, if you had the money, then uh, you, this leisure wouldn't be a problem, as it is, I find in the winter. Um, 
There is things that uh, you could go and pass the time over with if you had the money, but you just find that you've got too much leisure and not enough money. The older end of the generation, they didn't have to spend money. They used to get things up between themselves, flying pigeons, running whippets. Or the greyhounds, or running, jumping, wrestling, uh, football matches, the single men playing the married men for a, a potato pie. Anything just to pass the time, and they used to really enjoy it. All used to get together and go down to the last shift and have right a, a right good day of it. But uh, as we go now, we have to spend money for anything you want. I mean, if you're only taking the children out for a walk, they're always wanting something. You've got to always have some money. That's why we don't go out very often, because it's a little bit tight. You can't do everything you'd like to. The only free thing in Lee, as far as I know, is the library. Well, I, I intend to join the library. Uh, there is a small problem that uh, once I do join and I get in into the library, that there's literally must be thousands of books in there that you could take whatever you wanted out. It would no art gallery or a museum or, or anything like that. And uh, it would be a little problem to myself of what am I going to take out to read? Surely someone would find some interest in a museum or an art gallery, if it was only a small one. Just something for them to do when they had no money and they just wanted to walk around. Unless I, I took something out to educate myself or to take a course, or I just don't know. It may give him some interest in it, if there was such a thing. But uh, I, can't, I can't say that he would go in and really know what he was looking at, but he'd probably get to know and find an interest in it. More than likely, what I would take out would be the books on golf and fishing, and after I'd read those, then I may branch out into something that uh, never interested me before. Most of the time, I'm going fishing. This, this has taken a great deal of my time up. Whether I catch anything or not is immaterial. I'm, I'm, I'm outside, I'm in the fresh air, I'm spending very little money, and I'm really enjoying myself. There is two boating clubs in, in the town that uh, if I went to and I could afford to, I suppose I could join. But it's something that just doesn't appeal to me. I have seen them boating while I've been fishing. And there doesn't seem much sense in going with the wind one minute and then turn the damn thing around and going back the same way. It's stupid. I don't feel that it's a working class chap's hobby. I don't think he could really afford to, to buy a boat and the sail and the lot and join the club. We find that when we are fishing and we see these people come down with the boats, they look at us kind of thing and say, have you no more sense than sit there fishing? And we say, well, have you no more sense to ourselves than sit in a damn boat going up and down, you know? Um, this is perhaps a debatable point whether either of us is mad. They see their places their way, and we see ours our way, but uh, boating to me is a complete waste of time. In Lee, you're never far from the mill, even at school. And in the schools, the certainty of more time off for new generations presents a pressing educational problem. John Cassidy and Len Westerdale are two Lee teachers concerned about an education for leisure. We in school now should be spending more of our time, more of our urgency, more of our energy on educating people not so much for earning a living, but for the much more important business of sheer living itself. We can do very little, I'm afraid, for the people who are already suffering. What we can do, what we must do now, is to try and use all our energies to save their children from suffering the same fate in 10 or 20 years' time. It's quite easy to make a boy see the value of so many O levels and A levels because he thinks it's going to help him in his career. And his, um, his parents are also uh, convinced of this. But it's not easy to convince them of the value of, well, music or drama or art, uh, because many of these things are acquired tastes and it's rather an effort to acquire them. Everyone has within himself somewhere a reservoir of imaginative resource, which we must tap which we must persuade him is there. Some little talent, however humble, some sort of interest, which can be developed and serve as a basis for the expression of whatever is within himself as a personality. 
It's all right making provisions. We can make as many provisions as we like for cultural and other sporting handicraft activities. They're no use at all unless there is a feeling in people that this is what they want. Education itself must, must change, must, must expand, must widen to bring in all these other activities which at the moment tend to be regarded as um, non-profit making and rather unnecessary. What we really need is something in the nature of a national or international campaign to bring this home to all of us as urgently and as often as possible so that the administrators, the parents, the educational propagandists are all shouting with us. Then we can make strides. <laughs> place to go is still a working men's club. There are 33 of them founded years ago to keep the workers happy and sober. There are 69 pubs, 31 betting shops, two bingo halls. There are only two cinemas, one main library, no theatre, no art gallery. At one time, British industry was geared to a half past seven to 5.30 p.m. routine and all social activities took place in the evenings and, or during the weekend. Today, of course, with the continuous running of machinery in industry, people are not only having more leisure time, they're having the leisure time at during hours which were regarded previously as irregular, and uh, society hasn't woken up to this fact. In a few years' time, we'll be on the verge of a breakthrough in technological production, which will make everything that has happened up to now look like a car horse in comparison. When we get the age of automation, uh, the three-day week will not be the end, of course, and uh, people will have more leisure time on the hand, far more than they've ever encountered before. And there is a need to be thinking about these things now and to be acting upon them. local authorities to provide amenities, to townships to provide amenities, perhaps the big industrial concerns to provide amenities, and in fact also the trade unions. These are the things that society needs to do, but far be it from me to suggest, and I certainly wouldn't like this to happen, that the worker should come to be completely dependent upon the big authority, the big company, or the big union. I think we've got to leave room for personal initiative in this regard. I think that people have got to readjust themselves to learn how to fill in leisure time in order that they themselves can live a fuller, healthier and more contented life. Perhaps later on if this thing does advance and goes into other industries that it may not be as bad but just at the present now we're more or less like the guinea pigs feeling the way for this three days a week and we're just out on our own. <laughs> 